And this is an excellent turnout, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, the folks at the Ajax are probably wondering if they need to adjust the camera, but no, I'm not Rick Anderton. So there's nothing wrong with, with your picture. Uh, Rick Anderton is actually out of the country on vacation. So I'm uh, acting CEO while he's away. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Jordan. I'm one of the vice presidents at the hospital. And I have um, accountability for the women's and children's program as well as quality and transformation. So I've had a chance to be really involved in the integration process since we started working on this in March. Uh, but I also wanted to acknowledge there's lots of other uh, folks in the room from the senior team and, and from the management team who've also been part of the integration process. So um, folks that are, are in the room, if you have anything to add to anything I say, uh, please feel free to contribute. Um, the other thing, just from a housekeeping perspective, so everyone knows, we are video conferencing this town hall meeting across the two sites, so we will have to pause to give both sites an opportunity to ask questions and, and make comments, so we'll be doing that. And in addition, we are videotaping the session. Akila is here at the front with the video camera. We've done that uh, for the last few months, so that people who can't make it to the town hall, if they wish to do so, they can still go onto YouTube and, and take a look at what we discussed. Okay, so um, the focus of this town hall is on the integration process. And what I'm going to do is just go through, I hope fairly quickly, an update to let you know what's happened since the last town hall, tell you about some of the things that are coming up, some of the things that we've learned along the way. Then we're going to have a chance for you to ask any questions that you might have about the process, any <laughs> issues, any concerns. And then I have a question or two for you as well at the end as time permits, so that we want to get some, um, some feedback and some engagement from you. Does that sound like a, a good plan to start? Oh, I should have mentioned that there's someone that's taking notes. Uh, cap uh, okay, at the back, uh, we have someone that's taking notes, so don't worry, we will be trying to capture all of your comments and, and feedback. Definitely don't want to lose that. Okay. So folks at the Ajax site, is, is everyone okay with that, that agenda? Okay. All right, so just to give a, a little bit of context, and some of you that have been at other town halls or maybe you've read Rick Anderton's blogs, you would be a bit familiar with this. We always want to start with this just to ground people and to remind you that what's happening in, in uh, Scarborough and Durham with um, the Scarborough Hospital and, and Rouge Valley is not really unique to our two <coughs> hospitals. This is actually something that's a, as a result of a broader provincial healthcare reform process that has been going on for quite some time. And I know that you've all heard and, and read uh, about some of the financial challenges that we're experiencing in healthcare. We're also challenged to provide timely access and to provide good quality services. So at the provincial level, there was a plan written a couple years ago called the Action Plan for Healthcare. And Rick Anderton likes to go back to this all the time uh, to remind people. And that plan talks about developing a system that's more patient focused, where even the funding is more closely linked to patients and follows patients wherever uh, they may be. And we want to look at providing services closer to home for people, providing easier access, looking at ways that we can move some services maybe from the hospital into the, the community setting. So there are lots of different parts to that, including a new way of funding services. And that's one of the things that's been a challenge for us. But just wanted to remind everyone that there is a broader provincial framework for all of this. And it's not just unique to, to our hospital. Uh, so we wanted to clarify some of the things about what we are doing and what we're not doing because understandably with a process like this and so many different people involved, there's going to be um, a bit of broken telephone and, and rumors out there and myths. So we just wanted to clarify that what we're doing now is we're asking um, all of our stakeholders, community, the public, staff, um, volunteers, physicians, we're asking people for their input on, um, on their priorities, what's important for our local healthcare system and I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, and we're trying to be as transparent and open as we possibly can. Um, there are also some myths around what we're not doing. Uh, we're not going to be closing any hospital sites in the short term. That's not part of the plan. And we've also said that we're not going to be closing any of the four emergency departments in the short term as well. So those are some things that we have set as parameters to ground us as we go forward with this planning. What we have said is that this is our vision as we look to maybe um, integrating more closely. Uh, we want a system that's integrated and that meets the needs of the people in our community, provides better access, 
gives people a really good outstanding experience, which we know it's both um, sort of the technical quality of care as well as that compassion and, and customer service. That all makes up the experience. And uh, we want to use our resources more efficiently because that way we, we are uh, more confident that we, we'll have these resources over the long term. So we need to be thinking long term as we uh, make our investments. So what have we done so far? I just wanted to highlight uh, two or three major things that we've been working on over the last uh, month and a half or so. Um, at the end of July, July 31st, we held a meeting. It was held at the Scarborough Hospital General site. And we brought together about 75 leaders, physician leaders, as well as administrative leaders, people from our senior team and, and our directors as well. And we just wanted them to talk about, you know, from a big picture perspective, looking at the whole hospital. So we wanted people to get out of the, the mindset of their particular department or their particular program and just brainstorm around what do you think the benefits could be if we were to come together in a formal way um, bring together the two organizations. What do you think the benefits could be? And what are the risks that you would be concerned about? So we heard a lot of really good feedback. And I have to say there was a real feeling of optimism in the room. Um, and we came up with some benefits. Definitely we're really proud that you know we have a, a good uh, workforce, really committed, dedicated people. Both sites felt that way. And we thought that that would be huge as, as we come together. We need to draw on our, our people. We, both hospitals have a strong commitment to quality that would only be strengthened if we came together. Both hospitals have adopted lean as their philosophy and we're both using lean to improve quality. Uh, we felt that we both have a, a strong record of clinical performance and we could leverage that across the two sites. Uh, it would allow us to provide better access, um, improve our um, accreditation success. Unfortunately, both hospitals got the top accreditation award in 2012. We both got exemplary status. And we also thought a benefit is just our resilience. We've been through a lot. Both hospitals have been through a merger before, and both hospitals are on a transformation journey. And we're kind of a, a group that knows how to rally in a crisis and to, to just stick to it. We also uh, were aware that there will be some risks going forward that we need to be aware of so that we can put strategies in place to mitigate them. And one of them is going forward, we need to make sure that we speak with a common voice and have a really clear vision that everyone understands. Because that is one of the things that takes these kinds of processes really off the rails. If, if people are going in different directions and no one is clear what our end goal is. We thought that physician engagement, staff engagement, community engagement are going to be key. And we have to build in ways to, to get that from the very beginning. And um, the whole process has to be well planned, well thought out, lots of preparation, and well resourced as well. So those were some of the risks that we thought we needed to identify. So that session on July 31st was a really good jump start to uh, the whole process. We also brought together some folks uh, to be part of a stakeholder engagement uh, design. So what that was, was we thought as we go forward over the next couple of one months, we want to make sure that we are um, doing the things that people want us to do and expect us to do in terms of how we consult with them, how we bring them together. So we just wanted to get some folks in a room, and I think we had uh, three focus groups. The CEOs, the two CEOs went to all of them because it was really important for them just to listen and hear what you had to, to say about how you want to be part of the process. So we invited um, some hospital management staff, medical staff, the union leaders were all invited, folks from the community. We went out and talked to all of our local politicians as well and asked everyone for ideas on how best to uh, engage people. And there was a lot of feedback. There was one session that I think 24 staff and union uh, reps attended and they <coughs> talked about um, different ways that they, they want to be engaged. They thought it was really important that whatever we do, we're transparent, we're honest, we're open, we don't sugarcoat things, we tell it like it is. Uh, we realize that there's diversity in the workforce, even in terms of the hours that people work and, and scheduling, that has to be taken into account. People thought it was really important that we respect that, um, the, the hours, the, the, um, the challenges that frontline staff have in getting away from work, even to attend town hall meetings like this. We wanted to be cognizant of the anxiety that people are feeling about personal um, job security, but even just the loss of the patient care programs that they've been working in. People want to understand what's happening to, to those programs. Um, and uh, folks gave us feedback on some of the ways that they, they think would be effective. As much as we, we all roll our eyes when we hear about surveys, we did hear that that is a good way to reach a large number of people. 
It's a cost-effective strategy. Uh, we talked about town halls, and if we videotape them, um, that could help in terms of making sure lots of people get to participate. So we had lots of good feedback from staff. The physicians also gave us lots of good feedback. They like to meet in face-to-face -face sessions. They talked about having a website, which we actually have followed through on. I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, getting buy-in and, again, the transparency. So lo really lots of good uh, feedback there. The third thing that we did was we've launched um, 14 uh, working groups at this point, and there's another one that's going to be launched really soon. So on the clinical side, we have 10 uh, working groups. There are about 200 people in total on these various working groups from both hospitals. Uh, there's physicians, there's management, some of the groups have frontline staff as well. But I wanted to be clear about the working group process, because there's two parts to it. When you think about it, TSH and Rouge Valley, all together we have about 7,000 staff and probably about 800 physicians. So clearly we can't bring everyone together in a room to, to write uh, documents and, and figure things out. So think of these working groups as really the folks that are getting it started. So they're meeting, they're having three meetings. Each meeting is about five hours long and they meet in the evening, and there's a lot of background and, and preparation work in terms of looking at data, et cetera, even before coming into the meetings. So those 200 people have really made a commitment on the behalf of all of us to do that early work. So we have kind of a template, it's called a workbook. So every working group is trying to get to the same output. They have to sort of fill in the workbook. Um, and then that workbook is then given to everyone to look at. So we're posting it on a website, and we're also emailing it to people that are part of all of these programs. We're even going out to, to some of our community partners and other hospitals to get their input. So after these groups have met, after every meeting, they write up what they came up with in the workbook, they post the workbook on the website, and anyone that works, on, uh, that works for the hospitals or any member of the public can then go in and say, you know what, how did we do? Did we get it right? Did we miss anything? Is there something that should be added or changed in the workbook? So that's where the other 7,000 staff members and 800 physicians and members of the public have a chance to be part of the working group process. So it's not just about who is at the working group table attending the three meetings. Everyone has a chance to have their say. That goes for the clinical groups as well as four groups that we have that are looking at back office functions. So <coughs> human resources, finance, the hotel services, and, and information management and IT, they have groups as well that are also following that same workbook process. And you can go onto that website, it's called leadingforpatients.ca, and you can read any of those workbooks in draft form. And I hope that some of you will take advantage of that. There's another group that we're forming. Now, surgery is a really big program, and it took us a while to kind of uh, figure out how we were going to tackle it. But we're uh, planning to launch a surgery kind of a working group on September 16th. That's still a couple weeks away, so we don't have all the details worked out. But um, we have a membership list that includes physicians, frontline staff, management staff, CPLs, et cetera, that will be part of that group. And they'll be looking at the strengths and weaknesses of our surgical programs and some of the opportunities that we could pursue. And just as a little tidbit of information, one of the things we looked at was if we were to come together with TSH, we would actually combined be doing the largest volume of day surgery uh, cases of any hospital in the entire province. So we would have a huge surgical capacity if we came together. So there must be some opportunities in there that this group can look at. So as I mentioned, there are lots of ways that we're reaching out. There's the website, meetingforpatients.ca. That went up last Thursday. A lot of information is housed there. There's actually a survey there that you can complete to share your input. The workbooks are there, et cetera. Uh, we're going to be having something called tele town halls, telephone town halls. I um, have to confess, I've never been part of the Tele Town Hall, but I've heard of them, where apparently um, thousands of people actually can be on these calls. Um, members of the public, you as staff members, uh, physicians, anyone can call in. So we'll be publicizing the dates and times for these Tele Town Halls, and there'll be a moderator that will go on and ask questions, and people can, um, can answer. Um, we'll be having a number of community meetings. I think at least 16 are planned with family doctors, with community agencies, CCAC, physicians, etc. over the next few weeks. And we're also asking you, as ambassadors for Rouge Valley, to spread the word as well um, to your colleagues at the hospital, but even to people in, in your neighborhood or, or different groups that you belong to. Let people know 
uh, what we're doing and that there is an opportunity for them to provide input through these different means. Tell people about the website. Um, and as I mentioned before, as staff, you have a chance, uh, we'll have some time in this town hall for you to ask any questions that you want, but there's also the online survey if you go onto the website. And we're going to be doing um, lots of staff uh, meetings, smaller groups, because one of the things we heard loud and clear is that we can't just rely on the town halls. That's, it's a great uh, vehicle, but we have to do more. So we will be doing um, sort of a, a, a road show where we'll be starting with the senior team and having the senior team come around to as many departments as we can. We know we have to do that on nights and weekends as well. Um, and we'll be doing that so that we can meet with you and your colleagues in smaller groups and ask you some questions. We're going to be asking questions about what your concerns are uh, about a possible merger. Um, what are some of the ideas or opportunities that you might have? What are some of the benefits that you see? So you can look forward to, to that happening in smaller group settings. Okay? And as I said, the workbooks are posted and you have an opportunity to go in and provide feedback on the workbooks that have been drafted by the working group. Uh, coming up, there's a lot more uh, work to be done, obviously, so September is going to be a busy time for gathering information. Lots of these teletown halls, the community roundtable meetings. Um, in October, there will be more meetings and another teletown hall. And everything comes together in mid to late October. So that's where all of the information will be gathered uh, and put together into a report that will eventually go to the boards of, of each of the hospitals and then once they approve it, then they'll be sending it to the Central East Lynn with their final recommendation. And just to remind everyone about what the question is that these boards are going to be tackling, it's have we accumulated enough information to demonstrate that there is benefit to a merger? That, that's really the fundamental question. Uh, we think that merger is the way to go because the feeling is that, yes, we can integrate without merger and by merger what we mean is bringing together the boards and the leadership teams and we feel that without doing that piece it would be really challenging to really get all of the benefits out of the departmental <coughs> and program integrations that you can do so we felt that by having a common leadership structure a common accountability structure it would make it a lot easier and a lot more effective to make the kinds of uh, major changes that we want to make through integration so that's why the boards have asked us to go down this route and say, you know what, we think that this will work, but we need assurance, we need information, we need data, we need you to show us that there really are some benefits there. So that's what we're trying to gather. And if at the end of the day both boards feel that there is sufficient benefit to invest in, in merger, then they'll recommend that to the Central East Lynn. And the Central East Lynn then has to actually take that to the Minister of Health, because only the Minister can um, can direct hospitals to merge. So that's the process. The report will go to the Central East Lane Board November 27th, as it says on the slide. And uh, so uh, all of this will be made public for you to know where things are at as we, as we unfold the process. Any questions about anything that I've said? Or anything that I didn't say that you wish I'd said? Cindy? Um, the working groups that you... I just want to make sure that folks at agents can hear as well. Um, Cindy Dowson, QP president. Um, the working groups that you put together through the clinical and the back office, yeah. you said that it's made up of management, frontline stuff. Who decides who the frontline workers are that are attending these um, committee meetings? Right. That's a good, uh, good question, Cindy. Uh, it was the management that decided. Um, who would be the members of the working group. Um, and we, we consulted with uh, the leadership, the administrative leadership and the medical leadership to identify who the members would be, whether it was the physicians um, or the, the employees. Did you want to have a follow-up to that? <laughs> and when you're selecting those people, yeah. what criteria did you use to select those people? Right. So, for example, is it just somebody that you knew more, or um, like what was the criteria you used to select right. those people that to sit on these committees? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start, and then I see that uh, Amelia, our chief nursing executive, has her hand up as well. Um, um, from be from the discussions that I was part of, it was mainly based on content knowledge and role. So if we are having a group that's looking at oncology, for example, we looked at who's most involved 
um, in this program, the, the role that they play in the program, their knowledge, maybe they've even had some prior experience working with the other hospital and, and their knowledge. And I think availability ended up being a factor as well because we were doing this in the summer. Um, so Amelia, would you like to add to that from your uh, perspective as the CNE? <laughs> and then I'm going to see if Ajax has a question. For the committees that I know, like cardiology, nephrology, oncology, we chose the nurses who have been involved in the quality and uh, professional uh, committees. For example, Helen Hamilton is involved in the quality and risk committee. Allison is involved in the best healthcare experience <coughs> committee, or I can't remember the title, quality and work environment committee. And the one in uh, cardiology, uh, Cindy, is involved in the unit council. So. Uh, the ones I know. Yeah. So, um, Cindy, if you have a, another recommendation on, or some feedback on something that you'd like to see done differently, we could always take that back and, and consider that. Okay. okay. You want to talk about it offline? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just go over to the Ajax site, uh, just to check in. Does anyone at Ajax have a question? What's going to happen with Ajax? Since we're such a different district, we're different taxpayers, we've always felt a little isolated, and now we're feeling a little bit more isolated with what's been going on. Um, what's going to happen with, with Ajax is as a part of Rouge Valley Health System, Ajax is going to stay as part of Rouge Valley Health System. So if we merge, we would then be looking at um, a, a corporation that has four campuses the two Scarborough Hospital campuses, Centenary and, and Ajax. So from that perspective, um, Ajax is going to be part of, of the merge entity. <coughs> One of the things that we've said is that um, because the impetus for this was Scarborough, it was driven by um, some of the work that the Scarborough Hospital was, was doing, and the focus is mainly on the Scarborough community, that uh, we've made a commitment that we're not um, going to be uh, changing the delivery of patient care services at the Ajax site. Does that answer the question, or um... for now? Okay, <laughs> think about it. You can always come back with a follow-up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me bring you the mic. Uh, my question is: uh, when you selected the the, the strike focus groups? Yeah. Um, do you have a fair representation of all the dis disciplines like social work, pharmacy, and uh, physio rather than nursing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. And my uh, response, I, I sit on one of the working groups, but I've seen the, the membership list, which is posted, by the way. Um, if you want to go onto the website, you can see a list of everyone that's on all, all of the 14 working groups, the clinical ones and the back office, and you'll see social workers, pharmacists, um, technologists um, and some nurses as well. Yeah. So everyone is represented. Actually, maybe let me just take a pause for a second. Um, can uh, people put up their hand if you uh, were part of that uh, focus group on the design, the stakeholder engagement design, where you were asked about ways that you could be engaged? Put your hand way up, Laura, I see it. Cindy was there. Yeah. Teresa Island was there. Keep your hands up. Don't put them down. Uh, who's part of one of the working groups? Put your hands up. Uh, was anyone part of that July 31st? Now, keep them up. <laughs> Visual management. Um, and was anyone there for the July 31st session where we had all the, the leaders doing the, the SWOT analysis? Yeah. So you can see, and we didn't specifically invite these people. This is just who happened to be at the town hall today. But you can look around the room and see that uh, there's been a fair amount of participation uh, so far and a lot more to come. We we're actually able to track the number of um, hits to that website and we're going to be getting that, that data soon so that we get a sense of how many people are actually using it and what they're looking for on the website so that we can see if that is a successful way of getting the word out. Uh, yeah, Amelia? Just something. Sure. You should just sit here. here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. okay. I just want to add something about the representations. So we have a maximum of certain numbers, right? And um, 
it's TSH and RVHS. Uh, and for example, for certain group, if an RT has been selected at the TSH side, we try and select some other discipline on our side so that there's, equal, there's to yeah. some degree of equal representation. So if TSH, you say, oh, there wasn't an RT in, in any of the 10 groups from RVHS, but if you look at TSH, there is one. Same with pharmacy, social work, PT, OT, you know, a dietitian, and that kind of thing. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Amelia. Just one sec, Selena. I'll just go back to Ajax. Any questions? I'll get my stuff. On the Ajax side? <laughs> There's no representation from like critical care groups, like Emerge, ICU. Are you? Uh, oh, actually, that's a good one for you, Amelia. Yeah. So there isn't a working group specific uh, to critical care. We don't have working groups for everything. That, that's one of the things that I, I should have clarified because we just don't have time to, to address every single clinical area. So we did have to go through a process of identifying um, which ones we were really the biggest group. On. Oh. So we, we didn't identify that specifically, but I'll ask Amelia to talk about how it's being addressed. So for critical care, uh, the members, Alison Eichler is from RC, ICURVC, and also Vanji and I is a manager of ICU for both sites. She's a member. And I have invited Dr. Joseph Chen. So, um, so they're, they're, uh, you're quite right, there should be a rep from a critical care. I can't speak for ED, but w what was the other group that was asked? I think the question is more about why the 10 groups were selected, right? There's certain areas that there is no current focus on or working group. So it's really why were those 10 areas selected versus other areas, right? Like you, we've got nephrology, but not neurology. We've got um, certain, so I think that's really more, if you can describe that process. Yeah, well we have um, a task group that was formed to try to figure this out because you can imagine all of the programs that, that we have across the two hospitals. Where do you even start when you have just two months that include the summer? So that was the, the challenge that we had is to, you know, what, what should we even focus on? So a few of us are, are part of a task group that's actually chaired by the two chiefs of staff. So um, Dr. Naresh Mohan from our site and Dr. Tom Chan at the other site chair this patient care task group that had the job of figuring that out. And we came up with some uh, criteria, about four criteria, um, around the kinds of programs that, that we thought we would look at. And, and we wanted to look at programs that um, perhaps were regional in nature, um, um, most of the groups that we picked, but not all, are groups where there's a, some level of, of programming at, at both sites. We wanted to look at those areas uh, where we thought that there might be some opportunity, where maybe some work had already been done at, at the LIN level. So we kind of put all of that together. Um, and you're right, the list could definitely have been longer. Um, we initially cut off at, at 10 <laughs> clinical groups and then um, one of the ones that was missing initially was actually surgery, which um, stood out for everyone because it is the largest program at Rouge Valley for sure. And um, based on, on some of the feedback, we've decided that we will add um, surgery as kind of an 11th um, group. So we're putting that together, but we really feel we're at capacity now in terms of uh, how everyone is stretched, in terms of working through all of these things and the timelines. So. Um, that was how we came up with those groups. But I, I do want to emphasize that, as I said, uh, the reason these groups are doing this work is to put together some, some evidence that we can take to the boards to say, you know what, we do think that there are a lot of opportunities and benefits here if we merge. And here are some examples. This doesn't mean that these uh, 10 or 11 areas are going to get more attention than other areas or that they'll be the first ones that we look at once we merge. It's not about that at all. It's just some examples to demonstrate proof of concept. So by looking at these four back office areas and these 11 clinical areas, what can we come up with in terms of some potential benefits? And is it enough to move forward or is it maybe it's not enough and we have to, to uh, stay with the status quo? So it doesn't mean that they're any more important or that once we merge, they will be the first ones out of the gates in terms of, of integration. That is not what it's about at all.